ship of Theseus, hundreds of years old, made of wood, rotting planks replaced with new planks. If the ship is rebuilt plank by plank to where not a single original plank remains, is it still the same ship? My current PC was built a little over two years ago now. It was built on a whim, specifically for the purpose of producing the VFX for a little sci-fi short called Aliens v Trump. And of course I did need to build a new rig if I wanted to try my hand at a career in VFX. But like I said, it was built on a whim. Which means for a few days I researched what specs I wanted, then drove out to Fry's, bought all my parts. That one got home and threw that thing together as fast as I could. Groovy. Well, here's the thing. The only case they had available that fit all my parts was this massive fucking hulking goddamned beast of a case. This thing is 50 pounds of metal and tempered glass. It was super RGB'd the fuck out and had an excess of features I just didn't need. It's a great case for what it is, it's just not what I need. Lately I've been trying to really minimalize a bunch of stuff in my life, distill things down to their necessary forms make the systems in my life simpler. So I found this new case that meets all my needs and made the swap. So yeah, it's great. I got this smaller case, which made more room for my work area, which is now set up for music production stuff. I have a lot of ideas of how I want to do the soundtrack for this game. And I'm super stoked on getting back to making music. It's been a while since I've sat down and really tried to compose and record something. I basically have no formal training in music. I took a piano class one summer as a kid and a couple of years of guitar in high school, but my experience for the most part has been through just loving to play instruments casually since I was a kid. And then in my early 20s, I started researching my favorite artists and composers, deconstructing their work to find out what exactly it was that I enjoyed about them, why they seemed to stand out to me more than other musicians. And then I would try applying that to my own original soundtracks for my films. That process definitely helped, but articles and Wikipedia and interviews can be a slow way to learn music theory. So I finally took the plunge and started taking online courses for music theory. A lot of this shit is still going over my head, but sure enough, it is influencing my compositions. I discovered MuseScore, a music writing application in which you actually write out the notes and all the other markings that dictate how a piece of music is to be played. Second measure, second beat. Maledictus. You see? Yes, yes, G-sharp. Of course. Yes. Second beat of the third measure. Ani. Famis acribus addictis. Rest. Maledictus. Famis acribus addictis. Do you have me? I think so. And then it plays that back in MIDI and with a variety of instruments. Show me. Good. Sure, these instruments aren't amazing, but they're good for getting an idea of how the different voices play with each other. MuseScore also has a website where you can find the sheet music to your favorite songs. It's kind of hit or miss, but I was surprised to find that they had sheet music for some songs that I've had trouble even finding on YouTube. This is a great resource because you can really pick apart and dissect how music is written, and more easily find what all of your favorite stuff has in common. You can find a MuseScore file for a song, import it into the software, and for example, you could delete the melody and only hear the rhythm. This opens up all sorts of cool ways to learn from the masters.
After banging my head against the wall trying to write music with MuseScore, I finally busted out GarageBand just to record some music the old school way. <laughs> Come on, man, that's too new. I'm talking about that old school, man. You know what I'm talking about. The first song I made focused on getting a nice little melody down. Since writing melody is something I never really do very consciously, it was a good exercise trying to make something that would be pleasing to hear a couple times in a row without getting too dry. This is it. My next attempt, I tried giving the song yet even more variation. I think the idea of giving a song lots of variation is a little foreign to me, for my own maladies at least. A lot of what I've made in the past has been very repetitive with notes, and all the variation and progression was in the texture and in the mixing of instruments. I'm a huge fan of musicians like Philip Glass. <laughs> and bands like Can. and Noi. Who all make music that is very repetitive, but somehow make the few changes really impactful. So that's always been reflected in the music I made, but the kind of music I want to have in Memories of a Spy isn't really like that. I also used this second go to experiment with how chords could be divided between different instruments. This is the song I made. If you've been around on this channel for a while, you'll remember that episode of Ludum Postmortem about that disco game I made, and how my friend Sonny did the soundtrack, and how our friend Laszlo helped Sonny figure out what tools he should use to play a string section. Well, Laz came through again and helped me out big time. Go check him out. So Sonny and Laz turned me on to Native Instruments, which is like fucking magic or something. It looks pretty real, right? I'm sorry, I don't understand. How is that not real? What do you mean it looks pretty real? I don't, that's not, a, that's, that's real. There's no, that's... that's um, they make these virtual instruments that use samples from real live recorded instruments. Um, it's just gigs and gigs of these short audio files to represent all the different dynamics someone can do with an instrument all the different inflections. It's just so much fun to compose with it, especially since I get to do all the actual uh, composing part in Ableton, which is software that I'm pretty familiar with and have been using it for years. So here's the first thing I made, really trying to get a nice melody down and then playing with all the wild new instruments. Let me get this to this.
I love making music. Like, hot damn, it could be a real time hole. It's just easy to lose track of time when making music because for the most part, the decisions you make can be heard and felt instantaneously. You have immediate feedback. But it's also hard for me to make something that I think is good, something that I can be proud of to include in the game soundtrack. Seeing how devs like Lucas Pope and Tarn Adams have made their own music for their own games is like really inspiring. <laughs> Um, the soundtrack for Return of the Oprah Din is beautiful, but it's also terrifying at the same time, just like the game. I remember playing the prototype off its uh, TIG Source devlog, just being like, fuck, this guy does it all, and he does it well. The Papers, Please theme is also so memorable. And then there's Tarn Adams who made the Dwarf Fortress theme. I want to say that's the recording of him playing it too, I think. I don't even really play Door Fortress, but I love that song. And the way it sounds fits the feeling of how I've always thought of that game. Like, I'm sure if I played the game, it would feel the way that song sounds. Something I really enjoy is design on the dev tool side of things. All the cool tools that help make my job as developer easier and more organized. 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 It's very often the case that I'm running the game, testing some stuff out, and then I want to get to somewhere else in the map, but it's like super far, so I can either run all the way over there, or I can go to the editor window and drag the player object over to where I want it to be. But I just wish there was a way I could get over there quicker. Or something else is waiting for NPCs to go through all of their behaviors. And I wish I could just speed things up. In the past, I assigned a key to tripling the time scale, so I could toggle that on and off when I wanted to speed things up a little bit. If I wanted to see how NPCs traverse a map or whatever like that. I even left that developer button thing that speeds up time in the build that I released for that disco game. So if you want to go check that out, it's zero on the numpad, and that just toggles on and off how fast things go. So anyways, I figured it was time to make my own debug console. Okay, so this is me running. This is about how fast I go running. This is how high I jump. And this is about how fast all of the NPCs move around. So I hit the tilde key, get up my little console, and I could type in scale time and put in 0.2 and I hit enter and now everything slows down. Right now actually I think since the proc jam build I forgot to recenter my mouse after that all these guys are moving around in slow motion. Okay so I'm just gonna go ahead and set that back scale time one so now it's at full scale. I also have, I think it might be jump, and then put it to like 50. And then pause this. There we go. Yep. So I got my jump going up. And then I also have, I want to say player speed. Change it also to like 25. Yeah. Now I'm going extra fast, jump extra high. So that's the debug console in action. Let me show you how it works. So right here I have my debug and console game object and underneath it I have a canvas which has an input field and the input field has a placeholder text and it's text. The debug and console game object is always activated. So on the debug and console game object, I just have this FSM that waits for me to hit the tilde key 
and when I do hit the tilt key, it activates the canvas underneath it, as well as adjusting some of my other UI things and disabling player movement and all that kind of stuff. And then when I hit the tilt key again, it goes back. In the actual input field is where I have this FSM, this debug console FSM, where I have all of this, and this is the sort of guts of it. So this is just where it starts, it's an empty state, it's a dummy state. Then this UI and edit is where it gets sent off when I hit the enter key, when I submit whatever it is that I typed into the console. And here, what it does is it looks for what kind of command I'm giving it. Is it a scale time one, is it a jump one, or is it a player speed one? And what it looks for is just, just the word part of it. And then based off the word part of it, it sends me down here, to the corresponding state. So for scale time, what it does is it takes my string and then it splits it up into two parts and it puts it into this array. And then it says, take the second part of it, which is the number value, right? The first part being the words scale time and the second part being the number I entered. And then it scales time using that value. It's the same thing with the jump, except it just splits up the word jump and number. So for this one, it sets the FSM float for my player jump, which is in my player FSM. Same thing with the player speed, it's seriously the same thing for all of these. It just looks for that, splits it up, and then takes that value and changes the player move speed in my player FSMs. I also have this close console thing, so I could type in exit and it'll close the console. But otherwise, that's it. It's a really simple system. I think I've set it up in a decent enough way where it can be relatively modular and I could kind of add things as I go pretty easily. Another thing I've been really wanting is custom gizmos. Now this one took me a lot longer to figure out than I'd like to admit, but I managed to write my own very simple script, which makes it easy for me to just drag and drop new gizmo images for any game object. I'll put a download link in the description if you want to use that for your own projects. Okay, so for example, I have this NPC right now. This is just sort of a blank slate NPC. So let's turn on the gizmos. And I have a bunch activated right now. Usually I'll turn off the Playmaker gizmo. So I can come down here, this, and now I at least can see kind of where lights and stuff are, some text mesh things, and then I have like colliders and stuff like that. And here is my custom NPC gizmo. It's a little stick figure guy reading a newspaper. And then I have this, I have one for the player as well. So the player game object is right here. And with the player, there's not even really any mesh to see. So it really helps to have a custom gizmo for the player. And this one is just like, a guy sitting there, a little stick figure sitting there smoking a cigar on a couch. And yeah, you can click on this and it'll select the player. Uh, I can click on this NPC one and it'll select the NPC. So the way I've done this is with the NPC selected right here, um, I can go over here in the inspector and I have somewhere in here my custom gizmo script. And all I really do is type in the name of the file for the gizmo image. So I make the gizmo image in Photoshop and then I drop it into this gizmos folder and here is the image, it's an NPC one. So over here I just type in NPC and it goes and gets that. This is the first ever piece of C Sharp script that I've written that I've actually continued to use and is actually useful and I actually needed to do it because I just couldn't find anything like this available on the internet. So now I can just literally drag and drop that. You know, for example, this lamp right here, I can uh, click on this lamp, um, add custom gizmo, and then let's say I wanted this agent spawn one, right? So I type in agent spawn. And there we go. Yeah. You know, I could just make a lamp image, drag and drop in here, call it lamp or something, and then just type in lamp, and then it would show up there as well. So this is super useful. I'm at the point where I need to start seeing exactly how I'm going to design the way players and NPCs will navigate across these six environments. Generally, I know that each of these places will be about the same size, and since they're relatively small, I can place them all next to each other in the same scene. There will of course be some calling so you could never see any other city except the one that you're currently in. There's an in-game clock, the thing I showed you last time, that the player can always use to check what time it is. 
and that's always in sync with the position of the sun. So I need to figure out how that will change when a player travels to a different city. More importantly though, I need to figure out what the language of these environments will be. And I don't mean like German in Berlin or whatever. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? I mean how I can design the layout of these cities in a way that will ensure the player has a clear understanding of how they can navigate through them while also giving them enough room for like atmosphere. We got out of Honest Ed's. We, 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 we gotta go up the stairs. Got lost in Honest Ed's. No, entry. Why? Which way? We, came from, we back, came from the, no. Yeah, this is back to men's garments. Okay, so we're gonna go this way? There's oh, just a left here and then, and then we're out. What the is with this place. Oh, oh, oh. I don't want players running across huge distances and getting bored of seeing a whole lot of nothing, but I also don't want to pack up everything right next to each other. To the point where the player no longer feels like they're this globe-trotting spy on a mission, traveling far and wide, and you know, that whole feel of it. So instead of going straight into modeling all of these culturally unique environments, I'm using prototype assets. I tried some other modular level building assets, which worked fine, but have decided the best option for me is Cinti's Polygon Prototype Pack. It's just super dense with pretty much everything you would need to prototype out a game, and it's super affordable. The first thing I need to do is get a rough idea of how I want the city laid out, where roads and buildings are. When all of these cities are built up, I'll start figuring out the travel and time zone system. When the game is far along enough, I'll get back to modeling original assets like I did for some of the Paris environment. The cool thing about this is that I can model my pieces to the same dimensions as the prototype pieces, so when it comes time to replace them, I can literally just swap out the mesh and materials and everything will be built already. So I've been getting an itch to enter some game jams, but there's always this part of me that's like, no, stick to your game. You know, there's a lot of work to do, stay on target. You see, Lady Justice is a committed woman. She's a slippery little scallop, as you can observe. What are you doing? Oh, uh, I, I, marbles. It can be draining trying to bounce back from a game jam, and I really want to keep the momentum up with the development for Memories of the Spy. But then I read the details of Proc Jam and saw that they're pretty lax with their rules. A land with no rules and no laws to bind and restrict the soul and the heart. Freedom! Personified. And that if I wanted, I could submit a prototype of a game I was already working on. So I just picked one of the handful of procedurally generated aspects of the game I was already working on and decided to turn it into a mini game. I'm not really gonna get into this Proc Jam thing because I did stream a good deal of it, if not all of it. So I'll put some links to the stream playlist in the description. But what I will say is that the experience of a game jam, that sort of deadline and the crunch and everything, it was actually really helpful to sort of like kick my ass in the gear and to kind of make me work a little harder on the game than I might have otherwise. Something I tried figuring out during the stream for Proc Jam was this idea I have with how to deal with invisible walls and going from one country to another. Here, watch this and I'll explain. Let's say you could just see more buildings over here. Let's say I filled this out, right? Well, as you get closer to where that illusion would break, you know, let's say you were kind of like, say up there, you're walking around a corner that looks like this, right? And then you don't want to see any of that stuff. Well, what I would do is make it so that right around here, where you could see like right here, that before you hit this point, your screen would have an overlay over it and you wouldn't even be able to see anything. You would just see this huge overlay. So, if you backed away, the overlay would start fading out. So, I did this as a test. Let's say that doorway right there leads to an airport. And I don't really want you to go inside that building and see what's inside of it because there's nothing inside of it and that'll break the illusion. But you can see just enough where it's kind of like, okay, I think that that's, you know, there's an airport in there, right? And then so as you start getting closer, this image starts fading in until right about here where it's like really faded in. And at this point I would have it so, you know, the player is obviously committed towards walking over here. So when it's completely solid, I would have it just then commit to the transition and then you would suddenly be at the airport or be on an airplane or whatever. But if you kind of stop before that, it's just 
kind of transparent. You could still see stuff and you can even back away from it and say like, you're not gonna go do that. And you can just go back to the game. The reason you pay attention in math class is so you don't end up wasting a bunch of time trying to come up with what would turn out to be a very simple solution to a design problem. In this case, I knew that what I wanted was for one value to increase in proportion to another one that was decreasing. That as the distance between the player and the checkpoint grew smaller, the alpha value for a screen overlay would get higher. You know, so the screen fades in as the player gets closer. Just, just look at all these bullshit notes that I was scribbling. I don't know if you can see that. And this isn't even all of it. I must have spent like 15 minutes pacing around in my living room trying to visualize these values in a way that could give me a formula I could use. Eventually I googled something like number grows in proportion to another number shrinking or something like that and found a page where someone gives the formula for getting a percentage of an increase and a percentage of a decrease. Um, guess what? All you have to do is get the difference between the number you started with and the one you currently have. Duh. Like, fucking duh. This FSM is on the player, and there's just a game object over there by the door that I've called vanishing point. And you can even see this line being drawn between the player and the vanishing point. And there's a get distance action that's currently measuring that. So here's the FSM. On the first state, I have a get distance and a float compare. So when it does hit 10 units away, we go over here to the state where I put on that crossfade overlay thing. So what happens here is I'm getting the distance, I'm constantly checking on it. That first distance of 10 is constantly being compared to the current distance right here, the second distance. What I'm doing with it is I'm subtracting that second distance. I store that result as a new variable called difference. Then down here, what I'm doing is multiplying that difference times 0.1 just to have a smoother transition, otherwise it's very immediate because it's only 10 units. And then right here I have a set property which is just changing the alpha of that image. And it's set up to that multiplied difference variable. So you can kind of see it, uh, you can take a look at these as I walk towards it again, maybe you get an idea of how this works. So. See, I'm at 14, 13, 12, 11. So right about here, you'll start seeing it fade. You see, because I'm already underneath 10. Right, as I get closer, that value goes up until I'm like right about here, somewhere in the middle of the doorway is where it's like at its highest. So yeah, pretty simple, just sort of it's subtraction, honestly. That multiply thing is just to finesse it. So yeah, things are really moving along and um, it'd be nice to finish this game before my birthday next year. I really hate the idea of long production cycles as a solo dev specifically. I would rather take my chance out there on the ocean than to stay here and die on this shithole island spending the rest of my life talking to a goddamn Bible! And I have some ideas for very different games, which would be fun to make with like a team or at least one other person, you know? Making memories of a spy by myself is a way to prove myself, both to me and to the world. And when I say the world, I mean potential collaborators. So as fun as this is doing things on my own, I am excited for projects where I could be working with someone else. So yeah, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. If you dig this video, give it a like. If you want more, give the channel a sub. Ring that bell, say what's up in the comments. All that stuff helps tell the YouTube machine to put more eyes on my work. All the help is appreciated. Happy holidays and be safe, y'all.